What the Tech is sponsored by. Audible.com, the internet's leading provider of audiobooks, with more than 100,000 downloadable titles across all types of literature. For a free audiobook of your choice, go to audiblepodcast.com slash Andrew. Squarespace, the fast and easy way to create a high-quality website, blog, or online portfolio. For a free trial and 10% off your first purchase, go to squarespace.com and use offer code WHATTHETECH1. And by Carbonite Online Backup, automatic, continual, and unlimited backups for your computer. Try it for free at Carbonite.com and use offer code WHATTHETECH and get two bonus months with purchase. What the tech? Hey everybody, welcome to What The Tech. A, um, not a very special What The Tech, I'm gonna tell you guys that. Nothing just, special about today. Just be honest about it, it's sad. Yeah, we, we can't guarantee you anything with this show. We can guarantee yeah. that Paul and I will say Linux a couple times, we'll talk about Apple a couple times, and possibly Windows, we're not too sure yet today. Would you say that when we talk about Apple that we are complimentary or... I don't Not think I, I, I was actually thinking about this because I get those emails every time yeah. and I'm the I'm the last person someone could accuse of being an Apple hater mm -hmm. considering everything around me is an Apple product. I use a MacBook Pro. I have an you iPad. just recommended FaceTime to me, you loser. I just did. I told I used FaceTime for the first time with um, with my iPad. And, actually, no, I was on my MacBook Pro and I FaceTimed my wife because she wanted to show me something she was buying. That sounds awfully personal. And, it very personal, actually. We were we were FaceTiming, and it wasn't that. It was actually a couch. She wanted to show me, and I'm like, you know what? Let me just see it. And I FaceTimed her. The thing worked great. And as far as a video chat solution, there's no better. I, I haven't seen anything that does a better job, considering it's integrated. You know, right? Very easy. Skype on mobile is awful. <clears throat> yeah, no Skype on. In fact, I was just joking with Rafael Rivera about that this morning or earlier today. I was he talking about Skype on the phone. And I said, you know, Skype is so broken on the PC, we should just use it on the phone. And we just started laughing. <laughs> like, it's just so ludicrous of a concept. Oh, I didn't introduce my uh, my co-host. I'm here with Paul Thorat. Hey, Paul. Hey, how you doing? I don't know if anybody knows anything about you. You you have this small blog called Win Super Site. You write about mm -hmm. things about, about Microsoft. Yep. I had a whole conversation with Paul before. I told him to get with the time to write about Linux. Yes. Uh, and that, that's the plan for 2013, actually. Paul's going to ban in this whole Microsoft Linux. thing. 90 <laughs> right. per, listen, 90-something yeah. percent of the market doesn't mean anything anymore. Hey, it's all yeah, about 20, Linux. 20 years of experience down the tubes. You know? <laughs> yeah. Uh, but you know, we're, we're going to talk about Apple a little bit. Um, sure. We're pretty pro. Like Our conversations about Apple are never this Apple sucks conversation on the show. So I don't know how anybody could accuse me of disliking Apple. You you got a bad rap about that, but I've never heard you once say I dislike Apple, and it, it's it, for like a I just don't like Apple. That's all. I just I just don't I like just Apple. Don't like them. There, so now I've said it. Yeah, um, I do want to talk about something. Uh, I want to talk about Skype with you because you've been having this issue with Skype, and we rely so much on uh, with Skype to do the show. Uh, I know. Uh, and before the show, you kind of went into what's going on with the integration with Messenger and all this crazy stuff where it's uninstalling Messenger and uh, forcing everybody to Skype, which I think at first a lot of people welcome this integration. But sure. now uh, the people that use actually, you know, the chat service, the typing and the messaging service are not really That's that so good. happy. That's so good. So what's going on with it? Because I haven't used Messenger in years, so I'm kind of on, out of the loop. And I know a lot of our viewers use Messenger, and they, they're going through the same thing. Well, uh, I guess the only good news is that I'm doing this early because of what I do for a living. And so most people will not be forced off of Windows Live Messenger for another, I don't know, I think it's about three weeks. So, you know, I, I did the, the early upgrade just to see what it was like. And so there's a version of Skype coming that you can find now if you go through the the blog post that I wrote about the switchover recently. I don't, it, it was on the Skype blog, but it actually uninstalls Windows Live Messenger as part of its install, which is what's going to happen eventually because 
uh, Microsoft is getting rid of Windows Live Messenger. That's really app. invasive. Yeah. So Skype has many issues, as you may know, and one of them is that the instant messaging features are not great. But today I was in a I was in a chat with somebody, and I I did some I don't know what I was trying to do, but I did some convoluted keyboard court shortcut that wasn't Alt F4. It was some kind of other thing, and it caused all of my Skype windows to close and the app shut down. And I was like, great. I was right in the middle of a sentence when I did it. And so I said, okay, whatever. So relaunch Skype. And when Skype came back up, it, for some reason it was prompting me for a login. And so I provided my Skype credentials, you know, my Skype login and password. And it came back up and I started talking again with the guy I was talking to. But then about an hour later, Mary Jo uh, fully sent me an email and she said, hey, I, I can't reach you on Messenger for some reason, but I know you're online because you're, you know, being an asshole and I'm just <laughs> sorry, but, on Twitter, which is not what she said. But um, I can see her I saying was, that I was on Twitter, so um, <laughs> so I looked into it and I wasn't signed into Messenger and Skype, but because Skype had deleted my Windows Live Messenger install, there was no, you know, so it took me forever to figure out what it was. But what it was was I logged into Skype with Skype not with my Windows Live Messenger account. So if I sign in with Windows Live Messenger, I get my Skype plus Windows Live Messenger. But if I sign in with Skype, I only get, oh, I get Skype plus probably Facebook and maybe one other thing, but, but not Messenger. So it took me kind of a while to, to figure this out. And as I, I, I pinged Mary Jo when I got back online and I said, you know, I'm not the smartest guy in the world, but I do write about this stuff. And if I can't figure this out, I mean, I don't know what they're going to do. So the only thing I can think is that between now and the time when Windows Live Messenger goes south, they're going to update this to be better. I have to pray you to God. I mean, I, I was going to say that. I, I had imagined, because the hope was, wow, Messenger MSN does so much better of a job with messaging than Skype does. Mm -hmm. I absolutely hate Skype's Messenger. Right. It's, it's right. awful. That's true. By the way, Windows, it's not like, don't get me wrong, Windows Live Messenger has all kinds of problems too. So no, but I think this, it does a better stuff, job at it. It does a way better job at instant messaging, way better. And, you know, this is something, Raph, I know, because we, we talk a lot uh, each day online, and, and we've discussed this over the past years now, that we've looked at other messaging solutions for years, because as Windows Live Messenger has evolved, it's like gotten all these awful features added to it. And we've spent a lot of time, you know, there are these utilities that can... Uh, break off chunks of the UI so you don't see a bunch of the junk. And, you know, we've spent time playing with that stuff. But, man, I just want something simple. I mean, I, I wish that Microsoft Link was easier and easier to use with non-Link networks because you can, you can actually use it with Messenger, sort of. Uh, but I wish that the Skype guys would combine with the Link guys and the client UI would be designed by the yeah. link folks because those guys did a great job. That's actually the best. Well, the news that's that, type solution I've seen. The news that I've heard about Skype is that they're really gearing up to a major revamp of it, in, including their codecs. Right now, they use Silk yep. Three, and mm -hmm. they're going to be using something called Opus. And the Opus codec is an open source codec, and, and they say it's far superior to Silk. And the way that it's going to be working is that let's say you have. Um, uh, high quality, you know, HD, and, and your bandwidth is fine, you're going to be using the Opus codec, which is going to be fabulous. And if you drop down, it's going to be dropping you down to Silk, Silk 3. Yeah. But I don't know how that's going to be incorporated from version to version. My gut feeling is, and I, and I hope they don't do this, is that on every platform, it's going to use a different codec and a different version, which they've done that. <laughs> I mean, if you... If you're on the Mac, oh, the Mac experience with Skype is totally different from the Windows experience, which is totally different from the iOS experience, which is totally different than Linux. Oh, but then let's throw another wrinkle into this. Yesterday I was doing some, actually, we were, we were talking over Skype and he said, hey, um, can you share your screen with me so I can see this thing that we were talking about? And I said, sure. And I'm like, hey, I can. It's grayed out. And he's like, what version are you using? And I'm like, this version. And he's like, that's a weird, I, that's not the one that's on the site. And I explained to him where I got it. And he had to update to the version I was using so we could do screen sharing because that's one of those Skype features where the version numbers kind of have to be aligned, which is another problem with Skype because uh, this is something I recall from a long time ago on Twit from years ago when they were going between version 4 and 5 or 5 and 6 or whatever it was where it just wouldn't work properly yeah. unless you were on the same rough version number. You know, very strange. So 
there's a lot of stuff that needs to be cleaned up with Skype. And I'm, I'm actually not, I think the problem is that Microsoft gave away too much to Skype and I don't mean money wise, but too almost much control. Like, yeah, to, yeah. Just to get them to be part of Microsoft. And I, I, I actually think that if Microsoft could come in and take over this and they would clean up these problems because they've done it in the past with other uh, software projects that they've taken over. And I've seen this happen before where, you know, apps will be written in some strange language or, uh, you know, API set and they rewrite it and then they globalize it and it works. You know, it, they just do a better job at that kind of stuff. And I really do wish that Microsoft would just take control of Skype. It's ridiculous. They paid a gazillion dollars for it. I mean, it seems like they should be able to do something. right. I'm going to tell you a weird thing about Skype and then we could go to, our, to the other Skype story, which I thought was great news. <laughs> Um, okay. That let's say, and this is this is just inconsistency throughout the board, right? Let's say you Skype me, and mm -hmm. you don't have. Which also, HD. by the way, sounds horribly personal. It very listen. Paul was skyping me last night. It was late. I had a couple yep. to drink. Get I don't know what drinks. happened. <laughs> I just I just said okay, yeah. and I accepted it. That's how it happens. <laughs> and and that's how it happens. Uh, I if let's say you're doing four by three and you don't have an HD video, if you Skype me on the Mac. I mm -hmm. have the option to either have you as 4 by 3 or if I double click on you, it'll expand it and zoom in and make it 16.9. The 16.9 looks Which awful. It doesn't exist at all. Yes, it doesn't elsewhere. exist at all. That that feature does not exist on the Windows version. So if you're oh, Skyping me... it's completely different people. Isn't that right? amazing? I mean, It but has to be. It, I don't know what it is, but it makes no sense because on, on the Windows version, if you Skype someone, it automatically crops you to 16.9. All the time. So their theory is, well, you know what? It's everybody has a widescreen monitor now. Nobody's on four by three. So let's just do 16.9 all across the board. That's great. If your camera's sending you 16.9, if you're not and it's a four by three shot, it's going to look awful. It's, okay. it's, it's yeah. awful. And why not just give you the option? You know, like like on the Mac, you double click on it and it makes it four by three. You can't do that on Windows. If it's full screen, you double click on the window. Guess what it does? It minimizes your 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 Skype video. I don't know. Yeah. It's just bizarre to me. I honestly feel like we're going to spend a significant part of the next year complaining about Skype. It's it's the new Android. Yeah, it is a new Android. It says a yeah. lot actually. Open source, that's how it started, right? Yeah. Started as an no, open project. It? I think that's how it was. You know, I remember they were, I stayed far away from Skype for years because when it first came out, they were bundling it with Kazaa, the peer to peer service. Right, right, right. And I didn't understand why anybody wanted to use it. It's, it was weird. But the big Skype story and uh, something we wanted to get into today was that uh, Xbox is now going to be incorporating Skype. Which yeah, we thought would be happening. Coming. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, really good news because the chat on that thing is awful. <laughs> well, it's never, it's never going to be great until that thing we keep talking about, which is you know the next version of the Xbox, which is codenamed Durango, and will be able to multitask. And because I actually think that there's some awesome future where I'll be playing, you know, Call of Duty Black Ops Three or whatever it is. And you could Skype me from your Mac or from a PC or from another game on another Xbox. And you'll be up in some picture-in-picture -picture kind of a thing. And that's yeah. the kind of power that this next console will have. And so getting Skype in there is the first step. But, you know, as with everything else on the Xbox these days, we're kind of now waiting on the next, you know, the next-gen version because that's when it's going to get awesome. But you know what? This is kind of – it's an interesting story. And you would think, well, if you don't use Skype, it, who cares? But this – kind of is a transition to what Microsoft has been kind of hinting at, and that's mm -hmm. Xbox in your living room is not just a gaming console. The next generation Xbox will be your all-in-one media. You know, you're going to use it for everything. You're going to use it for video. You're going to use it for chat. Uh, yeah. You're going to use it for gaming, uh, web browsing, and I think that's amazing. Yeah. I'm, I'm really excited for this. Um. I mean, I'm just thinking about the possibilities. If it, if you get a Kinect and it has a camera on there, guess what? Now you have HD video. You have Skype in your living room. Everything is bundled into one device. You don't have to get all these different components. Right. It's all there. It just spilled water all over my lap. I'm sorry. That's yeah, okay. Paul got a little excited. I'm afraid I didn't uh, cry out like a little girl there. <laughs> <You shut up. laughs> 
<clears throat> uh, any news about the next gen Xbox? Anything coming out soon? Oh uh, yeah, yeah. I've gotten some my first leads about it um, in a while, so I'll have I should have some information about it soon. But it is um, uh, there's some information that was published recently about the kind of an architectural diagram. I don't know if you've seen that, which uh, I've been told is accurate. Um, and it's got kind of a modular design where most of the components that make up the new Xbox will be in a uh, like a gameless version, like a set-top box version. And then you add on a slice of other componentry, and that's the stuff that gets added on for the video game console version of it. How and, do you uh, think it's going to compete as far as gaming goes when something like Valve is, you know, the Steam is working on something and Valve and all yep. these, you know, it's actual PC games you know, on, your, on, your comp- on your TV? I, I think that the market for hardcore video gaming, which is the mar- basically the market for the Xbox 360 and the PS3, is somewhat limited. But then again, you know, it's uh, Microsoft kind of expands on that by adding all of the digital media stuff and the, uh, you know, the, the living room functionality. And I think the market for that is actually pretty humongous. So I think it's going to be fine. I don't think that Steam actually has a chance because I, I was at all. Fact, I was just, Coincidentally, looking at this stuff today, um, the market for PC gaming is extremely limited. The, the market for a, uh, like a PC gaming interface that runs on a TV is extremely limited. And then they want to make their own console, which is sort of like this Linux-based front end to their Steam-powered stuff, which is you know, also limited. And so uh, there's no reason that a company like Valve can't continue to make a lot of money for them and do a, a good job and all that kind of stuff. And I'm sure they will. But this is not the volume market of the future for gaming in the slightest. This is no way. And I, I think that casual gaming on devices like that Nintendo Wii U that you have or, you know, on the 360, and you'll see some of it through Sony as well. Um, plus, you know, the Facebook type stuff and all that. I think that's the, the volume future. You know? By the so way, I, I haven't turned that thing on since Christmas. Yeah, but you're a grown man. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I, I do think there's a big market for that kind of thing for kids and for families, you know? Yeah. I, I mean, I think now we're slowly realizing that. And, I, and I'm, I'm worn out with getting all these different devices. I'm, I don't want, I have a Roku, I have a Google TV, I got the Xbox, I got a PlayStation, I got the Wii U. And they all pretty much do the same thing, except the Wii U and the Xbox play games and the PlayStation plays games. Well, but, do the same thing from what perspective? Like, you mean game wise or content just- consumption? Yeah. Right. Uh, well, maybe you know, th- there's there is nothing that does everything, right? And so it depends on what you're looking for. Um, the Xbox 360, everything has the basics. Like you can get Netflix on everything, including the Apple TV. But once you get beyond Netflix, you know, if you want access to mu- different music services, different video services, it's really spotty, you know. And you see different things on different systems. I, I do think that the power of the Xbox hardware, even today. But this next gen, especially combined with the app infrastructure that they sort of have today, and again, we'll have more, you know, with the next version, kind of put makes puts Microsoft in a good spot. It doesn't mean they're the market leader, but uh, I think they're positioned pretty well. Um, Sony, for whatever reason, has always screwed this up. I have no idea why. I mean, their machines have always been, you know, powerful enough. But I mean, just, um, Nintendo's done the same thing. Nintendo totally screwed it up, and they had a great chance with this device. And they yeah. they they were talking about content deals with the cable companies, and they totally dropped the ball with that uh, the ITV, whatever they were calling it. Well, none of these. The problem is all the the content companies don't trust anybody, <laughs> you know. Um, and then uh, uh, Apple doesn't partner well, so I think Apple feels compelled to put Netflix on there because they don't have a movie subscription service. But that was, that's pretty much the only bone they've ever thrown the customers on there. That's like the only major piece of the puzzle that's not Apple controlled on the Apple TV, I believe. Did you see that video The uh, uh, from, I believe, CES? They were talking about like the project that they're working on. And they kind of had this weird presentation of, of like in your living room and everything that's going to possibly be able to do. Yeah. You were able to scan the room and, and play these sure. games. It was like this augmented reality type thing. Actually, have you seen the new, uh, the fourth Paranormal Activity movie uses the Xbox as a primary component of the movie? Like they, they, they sort of, it's like a matrix type effect where it's scanning the room and there's green dots all over everything. And, the, you know, that's how the X, that's how the Kinect sees things, I guess, supposedly. I, 
suspect it's not as beautiful or as uh, detailed yeah, as it yeah. looked in the movie, but it was kind of a cool effect. Um, and you can see, you know, like ghosts or whatever moving in the bumps, you know. I, I've been talking to a lot of people, and for Microsoft, uh, for a product that they're releasing, uh, there's a lot of excitement for this, you know, next generation Xbox. And I don't know why. I, I It could be because a lot of the people I've been talking to have kids, and maybe their kids are talking about it, and now they're like, okay, well, that's cool. I can watch movies on it, so they're excited about it. But I, I think this is going to be their the first console that's going to appeal to regular people that don't really play video games. Yeah. I mean, they've, you know, they're, they're working hard to make Xbox their entertainment brand. I think for, you know, the first 10 years there, it was video games. You know, that was the brand. It's been a very successful brand, but I think people sort of understand that it's not just games now. You know? But do you think people understand that? Do you think, like yeah. the regular person knows that I could watch Netflix and Hulu and all this oh, stuff on the Xbox. Okay, that, right, 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 right. That's a good question. I'm not sure about that. Because I, I, I have a relative, uh, my wife's cousin, and he wants to get a Roku. And I said, why? Mm -hmm. He goes, well, I could watch Netflix on a Roku. And I go, yeah, but you have an Xbox. Yeah, he doesn't even know. And he had no idea. He had no clue. I'm, he's like, what do you mean? I'm like, you could, you, it has all that stuff. You could do everything you do on a Roku on an Xbox. I mean, my, plus or minus some extra things, but... He just really yeah. primarily wanted to watch Netflix on there, and that's what you could do on there. Mm -hmm. I, I, I just I think it's the name, possibly. I think the average U.S. household probably has 10 devices that they could play Netflix on. Isn't that <laughs> amazing? Know? Yeah. It is bizarre. Netflix is on everything. They've done an, an amazing job of getting that client on everything. And Hulu hasn't. And Hulu hasn't, yeah. Which, which speaks volumes for the company. Uh, we're going to continue this discussion, but before we do, Paul, we have to talk about an advertiser. Okay. It's that time. And uh, we're going to talk about audible.com, the leading provider of audiobooks. I'm a big Audible fan. So is Paul. Uh, every week we, we do an Audible pick here. You guys actually sent a whole bunch of Audible picks that we're going to do next week. I'm going to go through two, three oh. of them next week. Okay. I didn't think that we would get so many. And uh, it was amazing how many people actually use Audible that are listeners of ours. So uh, I guess the message is uh, coming across loud and clear. If you go to audiblepodcast.com slash Andrew, you can sign up and get a free audiobook of your choice. Uh, Paul normally does a selection here. Uh, he has much better taste than me because I would just pick books about Linux and uh, listen to them and be uh, for all of you. I wonder if there are any books about Linux on Audible. <laughs> I wonder if there are actually. There's probably a book. I bet there's at least a book on there about the creation of Linux. Sure. Um, it doesn't make sense that anyone would ever want to listen to a book. How to use Linux. Oh, yeah, I mean, that doesn't make any sense. But Volume one. Let's look. That's not going to be my pick. Yeah, no, that's no, not your is pick. Nothing. What is your pick, Paul? So <laughs> this one's a little Boston centric, I know. So I gave some, I have an out here, I guess. But uh, Terry Francona, the former uh, manager of the Red Sox, was fired at the end of last, the, not last season, but the season before. And uh, he's now written a book about the Red Sox years, which is uh, fairly amazing. It's, co it's written by Dan Shaughnessy, who is a, uh, a Globe sports writer who I cannot stand. But I'm going to put up with it because I'm so interested in this story. And I've, I've only, I just got this today. I've only read the highlights of it uh, actually on the Globe. Um, and it's, just, it's some amazing behind-the-scenes story, uh, story, stories about his experience with the team, with the owners, with the player, you know, some of the famous players that have come to the Red Sox and so forth. So... Um, what year was he there? Two thousand and five. What year was he there? Yeah, he was. Oh, he started. No, he started before that. It was uh, because he won championships with the team in two thousand four and in two thousand seven. Okay. Um, but and then he lasted through two thousand eleven. So I don't remember exactly when he started. Maybe two thousand three, two thousand four, something like that. Two thousand four, two thousand eleven. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, he was an amazing guy. I wish they had never gotten rid of him, but. Um, this, you know, in Boston, obviously Boston, like New York is kind of a big sports town. So there's some, uh, this, this stuff is always the drama and the behind the scene, uh, so soft opera stuff is always just a big, big deal in the papers. But, um, the team just imploded that, that season it was absolutely amazing. And then this last year was a debacle. So we're kind of back where the Red Sox belong. You guys anyway, exploded in popularity and the, and the New York Mets imploded. Yeah, no, then we just exploded. And so, um, yeah, <laughs> anyway, um, if you don't like the Red Sox for some reason, then God damn you to hell for that. Um, 
Audible actually has an amazing uh, list of, of other sports titles, which I've linked to in the show notes. And one of the books I had recommended in the past, probably on Windows Weekly, is When the Game Was Ours, which is the Larry Bird, Magic Johnson story. Also co-written yeah. by a Boston Globe sports writer, Jackie McMullen, who I see sometimes at the games. But anyway, um, I, have, <laughs> I have a little joke tip in there because I was looking at Audible sports titles and I noticed that for some reason on one of these pages, the top book was a book about Jeremy Lin. <laughs> was it really? Oh, my God. Like, seriously, this guy has accomplished nothing. And I just... I. I, like why how could anyone read a book about Jeremy Lin? <laughs> like just the stupidest thing I've ever heard in my life. I um I, I actually just started reading about the Brooklyn Dodgers. Mm-hmm. And it the I'm it's so fascinating. I saw a great documentary a couple of years ago about it and I was always fascinated by the team about how, you know, yeah. now you imagine athletes, you see the athletes and, and they're all living in multi million dollar homes and they all have these huge paydays. But these guys were living in like Bensonhurst, like next to each other in like a regular house. They would get up like and they go and play like baseball. College, uh, <clears throat> that's funny. Yeah, like they all lived in like normal neighborhoods and they were a part of the like neighborhood and everybody was involved. And it, it just shows you the progression of the team and what happened at the end, them leaving New York, which was totally fascinating. If they had never left New York, the uh, the New York Mets would not have existed. So, um, you know, that, very that's, fascinating story. That's a future I would love to contemplate. Um, <laughs> what if the New York Mets never existed? <laughs> you know, maybe my life would be totally different because I was born up, born and raised a Mets fan, and uh, my yeah. parents had really high goals for me. That's why wow. I'm here podcasting. By the way, interesting uh, bit of trivia about this Frank Kona book. The audible version is narrated by a guy named Jeff Gurner, and he is the guy that has narrated all three of the Daniel Suarez books. Really? So if you get the audible versions of uh, Dame, uh, Demon, Freedom, or Kill Decision, he, this is the guy that also narrated those books. Oh, and he's grading them. Yeah. He's really good. I loved, I, I actually want to hear um, how he does in this one because I've only heard him do that kind of genre. Right. Uh, very cool, Paul. Uh, audible.com, audiblepodcast.com slash Andrew. I want to thank Audible for uh, supporting What the Tech. Uh, Paul. I'm yes. going to go to our notes because I had something I, I wrote here okay. and I closed down the notes. What did I do? Uh, where was I? Oh, so this is what I want to talk about because I know a lot of people are excited about the news. Uh, Microsoft Surface Pro on sale February 9th. Yeah, I am uh, too. Starting at eight ninety nine. Mm-hmm. Now, we discussed the RT. We've discussed the RT over and over and over again. But I really want to talk about this because why should someone buy the Surface Pro? This Surface Pro. <laughs> exactly. Uh, and, I, and I really want to, I actually, I'm, I'm asking you personally, why should I buy the yep. Surface Pro and not buy any other, you know, full-fledged Windows tablets that are Intel-based? Yeah. Is there, is there it, a reason? N- no. I mean, I, it, it's, it's strange because um, I think what this comes down to is a personal preference where obviously you could buy a touch-based ultrabook um, with an 11-inch screen mm-hmm. for significantly less money than this, right? So why would you buy this, you know? Um, this thing is an all-in-one device that I think is a peak at the future of computing. I think that this form factor is correct. I They've, they've done a kind of a very Apple thing across the board from the design perspective of it, a gorgeous device made out of very high quality materials, the touch cover thing, very, and type cover system, very innovative, but also very limiting, right? It has a single USB three port on the device and a a second one for charging uh, portable devices on the power brick. But it's, it's just this, it's Microsoft's view of what these devices should be, which is why it's immediately interesting because this is a company that has allowed its partners to dominate that conversation for years and years. And one of the things a lot of people who aren't, you know, maybe firmly invested in the Microsoft side of the world don't understand is that Microsoft has spent the last 20 years begging its partners to make innovative hardware and actually coming up with prototypes, which it would show to its partners and say, here is something that you might build that would look beautiful and people would want. And these companies never have done it. They never did. And so I think for... Many, many years, uh, just tired of being snubbed, tired of people having bad experiences with PCs and so forth. The thing that's interesting about the Surface, and this is true of the the RT version as well as the Pro, is that if you look at it kind of logically, 
it falls apart in all kinds of ways. And in, the in reason, what sense? That's interesting. Well, in other words, because all right, I'll just give you here's uh, many ways. I mean, almost in any way imaginable. So, for example, this thing has an Intel I, uh, Core three, I'm sorry, Core i five processor, third generation uh, processor that came out in May 2012. It is a processor that has graced thousands of different computers in the past year. It doesn't have a next gen processor. It doesn't get eight hours of battery life. It it's not particularly well suited for mobile devices or anything. It's just kind of a just is what it is. You know, there's nothing special about it. Um, people who really care about specs and so forth, things like that, would look at that and say, yeah, that's not what I want. That, that would have been a good computer a year ago. Whereas I think that the, the person who is attracted to the surface doesn't think like that. They're not thinking about those specifics. You know, it's like the argument you could say about Macs versus PCs. The, the chipsets and processors inside of these computers are exactly the same. How come Apple sells computers that cost, on average, $1,420 for a laptop in the United States, and the PC market sells devices that cost $420? Why would you spend $1,000 more in a MacBook? Yeah. You know? There's always reasons, but the reasons, they never come down to specs. It's not because the Macs are out, you know, outfitted with more RAM or larger hard drives or... Um, you know, better processors. That has nothing to do with it. And that's what the Surface is about. It has all the basics from sort of a hardware perspective. It does all the right things. But it is a, a pure expression of what a multi-touch Windows 8 device is. So it's know? almost like the, the pinnacle of, of this is the device that everybody should kind of follow. This is what you guys should be making. Something like this. Yeah. I mean, the in other ATIV, words, the ATIV, Rob Greenlee is in the chat, and he posted the uh, the Samsung ATIV Pro, and it's it's yeah. a really nice it's a really nice it's, device. Okay. So, for, so okay, so I have I have one of those. In fact, I have. Um, let's see if we can find it. <laughs> it's around here somewhere. I have. Oh, it's in the box. That's why. So there's an ATIV uh, 500T, which is a uh, Clover Trail based system, and then there's the version he's talking about, which is a. Um, it's based on the same processor, if I'm not mistaken, as the Surface Pro. Clover Trail is the newer one, right? Yeah, got, but it's the Atom. Okay, it's the Atom based one. Okay. So you're right. I mean, from from strictly like a spec standpoint, uh, the Adif Pro is very competitive to the Surface Pro. The difference is, this is what the devices look like, you know, side by side. And um, well, this, I can't see myself. I'm on Skype, so it's it's kind of hard to tell. But they're very. Oh, you can't even tell. I'm sorry. So <laughs> let me do it this way. There, th there's a huge difference here um, in size and weight and, uh, you know, the form factor. It's, it's, I'm, I'm not doing this well. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's, it's hard for me to. But the, the surface is thin and light and wonderful. And the ATIV is heavy and plastic and not so wonderful. It, the, the ATIV is, is a PC in the sense that it is pragmatic. You would... Get this device because you compare the specs and the battery life and the, all the other things. And you say, you know what? This is, more, this is a better value. The people who buy the Surface look at it and say, that's what I want. You know, it's like almost an emotional thing. But I mean, it's coming at that, to that, a grand at the end of the day. It, it doesn't, I mean, you got the 899. Yeah. It's, a ni it's a $900 device and yep. it doesn't have the keyboard. You add another 120 bucks. So you're over. It's, it's expensive. A so thousand here's bucks. What, here's what I would say to you. Uh, you're right. And I, by the way, I've, I've been saying this uh, about devices like this ever since the first iPad came out. It's too expensive. That said, um, this device, the base version, eight ninety nine plus a type cover, uh, which is the you know the real keyboard, would be like a thousand thirty dollars. Is comparable in price to an eleven inch MacBook Pro, uh, MacBook Air. It is uh, thinner. And thinner, although it's obviously the MacBook Air tapers on one side, and it's a little, it's even a little bit lighter. And so when you compare it to that, it is, I would say that it is the same premium type of machine as a Mac, but also that, you know, for the Surface, I mean, this is pretty much as high end as it gets right now. So it is literally as high end as it yeah. gets. Um, obviously, you can, you know, they don't have a docking system, which I wish they did, but. You know, you could plug this thing into a, uh, a desktop. You can expand it out to a huge monitor. You can attach your keyboard and your mouse and all that stuff. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty serious computer, too. So, 
I think the benefit of this is that it gives you that all in one. And by the way, the ATIP does as well. I mean, all, all these kind of hybrid machines do this. Uh, gives you that kind of all in one experience. And and it's also a real PC. It's not a you know the Windows R, uh, Surface with Windows RT is a companion device. This is the real thing. It is. But do you do you see? I I understand why they had the Windows RT version, in a way. Like, I kind of understand it, but like, t- why do we have desktop mode in there? Now I, yeah. I know well, why they now. Have, yeah. Because they didn't finish the, yeah. the, the Metro, what, whatever, yeah. modern UI. So it, it, that makes sense. Okay, fine, I totally get that. But as far as the future of Microsoft Surface, the brand, as far as mm-hmm. these tablets go, do you, can, I, I cannot see how RT will survive when right. you have Intel-based chipsets that are going to be coming out this year, that are going to be f- f- much faster than RT uh, than the ARM processor uh, and much better battery life, and it'll be a full-fledged Windows tablet. Right. So I actually I agree with that. I, I guess the only the only out I would provide to Windows RT would be that I think the future of that system is for that seven-inch market that. RT makes a lot of sense for something that would be uh, like that Xbox Surface that's been rumored, you know, kind of a, yeah. a, a gaming specific system uh, for an ebook reader that also does all these other things, you know, much like an, uh, an Amazon Kindle Fire HD. And that, that in that market, that's fine. And it's and only, that, only, me- only the modern UI, no desktop. Eventually, right? I mean, today they have to have it because, you know, that Metro. User experience is immature. It's not complete. But yes, in the future, that that's it's going to go. No doubt about it. I told you, my wife, she does not go into desktop at all on her uh, Windows 8 laptop. And I'm amazed by that. I was just uh, chatting with Mary Jo. She published an article today on ZDNet about how she's going to stick with um, Surface RT. And uh, she's interesting to me because, you know, her and I do a lot of the same things from a from a career perspective. But I spend a lot of time in Microsoft Office, and she writes in, in Notepad, which blows me away. It, it reminds me of um, uh, this guy, just Neil Stevenson, had written about years and years ago. Uh, had written about how he wrote, a famous author, uh, and uh, he was using Linux at the time and writing in some bizarre text editor, and you know, pushing text through this processor that would do like spell and grammar checking and all this stuff, and it just seemed crazy to me, but. Um, Mary Jo uses a very uh, less is more kind of approach to computing. Mm -hmm. And for her, even though there there literally are no killer apps from her perspective, Metro apps, it's that system is enough and it's really portable. I mean, that's the thing that it it does get eight to nine hours of battery life. You know, she uses the type uh, keyboard. It's got notepad. (laughs) You know, I mean, she recommended to me a a Metro text editor today that I was kind of looking at, but she literally does not even use Office, even though it comes on there. And um, for her, that's enough. And, you know, honestly, I mean, I, I realize there are many, many ways that you could c- put something together that was like a keyboard and a screen and did text editing. It's not a, you know, a <laughs> it's not rocket science, but uh, Surface RT for her has been a good buy and she really likes it. And, and her needs are very simple. So. And she was, she was on the fence about it. She wasn't really. Yeah. Prior yeah, to yeah, the yeah. launch, she wasn't really crazy about it. She, she actually, mm-hmm. I think she said a couple of times, I'm, I'm not updating my computers to it. I'm sticking with Windows 7. Yeah, and she, right, she had some hope for a while that, you know, if this thing would work out, that she could replace her laptop with it. And what she's found is that she can't do that. Mm-hmm. But this thing does allow her to get work done. Now, I personally, I tend more toward that Surface Pro side of the fence because I do need Adobe Photoshop. Um, I do use several desktop applications. Um, Photo gallery, for example, is one I use pretty regularly. Um, I, I think, you know, again, it, it really depends on your needs. I mean, we're all different. We all have different ways of doing things and different ways that we want to do things. Um, I try, you know, I've actually, it's funny, I also have been using Windows RT on Surface more recently than I did before. But it, 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 you, you want to have your computer off there to the side because there are just are certain things I'm not comfortable doing on it. And, you know, uh, photo editing and resizing, for example, is a classic. Uh, it's just, for me, is not working on Windows RT. I mean, this is the uphill battle that Microsoft is going to face for the next, you know, for the coming years, because this is a totally different way of doing business for Microsoft. 
and they they've kind of yep. gotten used to people have kind of gotten used to as as okay this is what windows is this is what a tablet is and now you've kind of combined the two into one and you have to convince this this group of people that are using it to say no 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 this is what it is i came to the realization i will not recommend anybody that has a laptop to upgrade to windows 8 if you're buying a laptop and it comes with windows 8 then that's fine your yeah. experience on this thing will not be great if you're on a on a laptop that's three years old. You should not upgrade. So, hmm. you know, it's funny. I, this is a, this is not a. By the way, so I actually think that historically speaking, the Windows upgrade process has always been fraught with the potential for trouble. You know that the act of taking a a, a working PC. And upgrading it to a new Windows version is not for the faint of heart because it's something could go wrong. It's like jumping out of a perfectly good working, you know, uh, perfectly good airplane. Like, why would you do that? It's yeah. crazy. Um, that said, I mean, and, and by the way, this is not a reason for a normal person, to, and no normal person would upgrade Windows, but not a reason for anyone to upgrade to Windows. But even on the desktop, even without any, even before you talk about any of the new features in Windows 8, I actually happen to prefer the graphical style of the windows and so forth that are in windows eight. Like I, when I go back to windows seven, I, I really find to me that it looks old fashioned. Like I don't like the way it looks. And Windo it's something, yeah. it's, it's something about that kind of nice opaque look of the win, you know, the windows, um, and windows eight. I just like it better. Now that said, I mean, obviously you have to put up with the Metro stuff. The, you can't escape it. There's a start screen. There's the side UIs and, you know, the task switching stuff, it's all there. I mean, you just, you know, you kind of deal with it. And, but, you know, we've talked about this. I use Windows 8 on my desktop computer every single day. I use Windows 8 on my non touch Ultrabook. And those are my two primary machines. Um, I wouldn't go back to Windows 7 on either one of those, personally. No, I, and, and you're right about that. I, I installed Windows 8 on this computer. Uh, I had it on desktop. And my experience on the desktop was better for me with Windows 8 than it was on an older laptop. The laptop is maybe two, three years old. And yeah. I attribute that to the the, the multi-touch reliance on multi-touch in Windows 8 because it's a, it's a touch-based system. And yeah. even if you're using a laptop, you still have to do gesturing. Uh, not, and this is not, again, not, not a reason to upgrade, not, 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 not something that will impact you on a day-to-day -day basis. But um, if you have a... a Three-year-old Windows Seven laptop probably takes like twenty to thirty seconds to boot up. You know, cold start. Um, put Windows Eight on there. I bet it takes ten seconds. Oh no, it's much faster to start. Yeah. Absolutely, it's amazing. Absolutely, I mean, and again, not not a reason to do it. Um, if you are the type of person who finds yourself reinstalling Windows a lot, uh, there are many reasons to go to Windows Eight, um, and, and not just because it's you know more reliable and all that kind of stuff. The, the process of refreshing or resetting. Uh, the PC in Windows 8 is a million times better than it was in any previous version of Windows. That stuff has gotten dramatically better. No, no, no. And, and, and I don't want the chairman to get me wrong and the viewers to get me wrong. I, I think Windows 8 is a far better operating system as a whole than Windows 7. Uh, that's a given. And even the desktop experience is better. I think they've, they've really cleaned it up and it looks great. But yeah. the people that have upgraded that I know... Uh, they've had a difficult time adjusting to Windows sure. 8, and I don't oh, think yeah. it's because Metro is so different, and it, you got to you know you got to use the the Windows key to pop it and back and forth. I, yeah. I think it's down to the hardware that they're running on, and if you're going to run Windows 8 on a three hundred dollar laptop from two years ago, three years ago, your user experience will be totally different than someone that installed it on a computer that's you know brand new. Yeah. Sure. My wife's my wife's Lenovo, which is not a high end Lenovo. It's a mid, you know, five hundred bucks. It's phenomenal. It's right. great. The the experience is great. The gesturing is great, and this is not the best hardware. So if someone is buying, you know, a thousand dollar laptop or or, or ultra book, I, I think it's going to be a flawless experience. I just think it it's so Windows eight for the first time. I think Microsoft is so reliant on the hardware. That if the hardware is not great, your user experience will be awful. And before you could kind of get by that, I don't think you could get by having an awful trackpad on your on your, <laughs> you know, yeah, keyboard. Yeah, yeah. 
on your on your laptop. I don't. I, that's just my opinion. I mean, I could be wrong about this. I know you've installed I, it on so some far, stuff. And, I found I found trackpads to be infuriating. See, you hate the trackpads. You hate well, all they, of them because they a lot of them they've enabled these multi-touch gestures, which I'm continually triggering by mistake. And they're not good. Exactly. Uh, this is horrific. So your your palm hits the thing. And it flips through two windows or something, and you're looking at some Metro app instead of whatever you were. And listen, people ask me, me crazy. and people ask me all the time, why do you use a MacBook Pro if you know you're a fan of Windows? Well, I think the trackpad on this thing is phenomenal. Yeah, it, well, uh, put a put it slightly different. I would say that the multi uh, touch gestures that Apple built into Mac OS X are amazing. Mm, uh, yeah, um, it is. You it, there's nothing in a uh, sorry, that's not the right word. There's nothing. Um, obvious about it you have to learn it it's you know the same thing on gestures on windows 8 you it's it's not something you just you know you pick up and just start using but if you can master those gestures in mac os 10 it's it's actually very efficient you know you just have but you have to learn it it's it's not something obvious uh, but once you do learn it it's that's a that's a pretty good way to do things one of our and viewers consistency with the ipad too you can turn on Multi, uh, multi-touch gesturing on the ipad as well. one of our viewers uh, hellcat in the chat room sent a uh, very long and detailed email um, mm-hmm. about what he likes about Windows 8 and what he would change. Okay. And it was very similar to that concept that you had on your website like a year ago about what desktop should be like on Windows oh. 8. Yeah. And I don't know if he had sent it or he had, he had, you would, he had seen it or not, but I mean, that that's kind of the common sense evolution path that Windows was going to take if that's how they went. But I don't so think that's yeah, what like, they tried right, to let me, do. Let me, th- let me throw something theoretical by you. Okay. Microsoft will never enable floating Metro applications in a window on top of the desktop. That will never happen, okay? Which was the thing you're talking about, I, I think, right? I think so, yeah. Yeah, they will never allow this. So that, that is not going to happen. But, and, and, and I want you to think about this in the context of the desktop is going away, and people st- seem to want to argue that it's going away. Just so we're clear, it is literally going away. Within the, co- within the context of that, what if they enabled you to run Metro apps on top of other Metro apps, including the start screen? If Microsoft did that in Windows 9 or even in the next you know, update to Windows 8, that's Windows coding. OS X. But what if they did that? Yeah. Would that be okay? Would that be enough? I think the issue that people have is the fact that Multitasking on Windows 8 in in the yeah it's a joke modern UI environment does not yep. exist. It, it's it's non-existent at this point, and well, that's why I, we're still. It's, well, it's, it's it's not that's not fair to say. No, it, it's not. It, but it completely multitasks. What, not not what, like what you're talking about multiple apps on the screen at the same time. Multiple apps at the same time, but it doesn't exist to the to the to what we know it as. I mean, as far as you know, even the Mac OS OS 10 goes, and how. Desktop is gone. You have applications and you put them all over your yeah, screen so I, and it right. works. But in other words, in other words, desktop's gone or just not part of this equation. Maybe it's still there in Windows 9, but not in Windows RT2, whatever. But you could have multiple Metro apps in what are essentially floating kind of chromeless windows next to and around each other. Would that solve your problem? Is that enough? Assuming that in this future that the apps you want are also available in that metro environment, including Office and Photoshop. Like, if that was the case, wouldn't that essentially address this issue that we have? Wouldn't that be enough? I think so. I think that I would think that so. would that be a lot of people's concern. That would. It's interesting. Yeah. Um, I think you can expect that to happen. Ah, very interesting. Uh, I do want to take a little break and talk about our sponsor, Paul. We, we are I- packed. People love this show, and uh, Carbonite loves this show. Carbonite dot com. Online backup uh, is uh, sponsoring what the tech, and I have I actually have a I have a story rather than doing a read. Um, okay, I'm not going to sit here and read from a, a a script to talk about it, but I do want to talk about something that happened to me over the week. Uh, last couple of weeks, we've been talking about Carbonite on the show. Paul tried out Carbonite. I installed it on my wife's computer. Thank God, I have need. I'm not really. So by the way, I just I, I'm sorry to interrupt. Go ahead. I want to be clear. I I am using Carbonite. You so are. I didn't try it. I'm using. Oh, it. you're you're totally using it now. Yeah, I paid for it. I'm using it. It works. Oh, that's amazing. I'm really yeah, happy it works for you. Didn't just try it. I'm, I'm literally using it. Um, I put it on my mother-in-law's computer about two weeks ago because she mm-hmm. has an older laptop, some older HP, and 
She always has issues with it. I, I know the hard drive is going, but I'm not going to sit here and do a hard drive replacement for her on the thing. I kind of want her to go and buy a new laptop. So I installed Carbonite. I, I signed up for it and I said, you know what? Just in case, let's back up all your stuff. Let it sit here overnight. Or just plug it in, have it connected to the internet. Don't turn it off and let it let it update. She had she doesn't have too many images or she doesn't have too many uh, MP3s, nothing like that. It's all work stuff and it's all documents, years and years of documents that she's literally been burning to a CD and putting them on every computer that she gets one by one. I installed Carbonite on there. About two days ago, she called me. She goes, the computer's dead. I've lost everything. I go, no, you haven't because I installed this thing called Carbonite. She got the new laptop. She picked up a, a new Dell. I don't know. I forgot the model. I got a Carbonite on there. I put everything back on there and it, perfect. It's like it never happened. And she has a new piece of hardware. So for something like that, I really think it's totally worth it. And when we talk about backing up, it's one physical, you know, the actual copy, a physical backup and yeah. somewhere else on the cloud. That's how I see backing up. Because if, and you know what Paul people tell me all the time to go, I back up my MP3s all the time. I put them on a, on a USB yeah. drive. Uh, I put them on, you know, a, I have an external hard drive I put everything on. And then I ask them, I'm like, oh, do you keep it on your laptop? They go, no, I don't have enough space. I have an SSD in there. That's not a backup. Right. That's your stuff on some hard drive that could fall apart. Why not just sign up for Carbonite? They, had, they start up at 59 bucks a year. Uh, if you want to add external hard drives, it's a little bit more, but well worth it, if you ask me. It, pretty cheap, 59 bucks. And uh, if you use promo code, offer code what the tech, you get two bonus months with the purchase. And you can sign up and try for free if you at Carbonite.com if you use offer code What the Tech. I really think this is a phenomenal service, and I'm not, you know, I don't want to sit here and read from a script about it because I actually use the products that we're talking about, and I'm actually amazed how well Carbonite works. It's it's hassle free, no thinking behind it. You just do it once, and it automatically, continuously backs everything up. Uh, and I I encourage everybody to try it. Carbonite.com offer code What the Tech. To get a uh, to try it out for free, and you get two bonus months if you choose to sign up, which uh, most people do, Paul. Most people yeah. do. Uh, thanks, Carbonite, for uh, supporting the show. I, I really I, I want to touch on this conversation again because it, it's interesting, and it and the conversation is still continuing. I thought it would die out. This well, what if Windows did this? What if Windows Eight did that? But it's yep. it's fascinating to me that well there's this evolution of this product and and you know we always bring up the term ev revolutionary not evolutionary when it comes to apple but this is a revolutionary change to the pc right and but, the, but it's also that first step you it know? is so yeah yeah it's not done i mean you know people are asking in the chat room why did they just do that in windows 8 if they if they could do that way you know because they they had to ship something before 2015 you know um the the current I, it's weird like there, there is there are things in Windows 8 that I don't understand. Um, <clears throat> for example, the this snap thing that they have in uh, in Windows 8 is is horribly horribly designed. It gives you you know someone I think described it as a seventy thirty split. It, it's not a seventy thirty split. The, the snapped app gets three hundred and twenty pixels. That's all it gets. It's 320 pixels even if your screen is 2560 by, you know, whatever, 1600, whatever the resolution is. I mean, it's, it's a stupid amount of space. It, it's yeah. not even that sophisticated. And I think that's something that's going to have to change in the future too, other than the fact that what I just described before the break will maybe make it unnecessary, you know. But we're thinking about the software way too much. I feel like the, the, the future of the PC <clears throat> yeah. is in the hardware. And this change from Microsoft, this radical change that they've done to the way that we do computing is yeah. going to affect the, the evolution of the actual PC market. Oh, yeah. I, I, I don't think in 10 years we are going to have these standalone, you know, these laptops in front of us that are not touchscreen and don't detach. That yeah, is actually, obviously I, the future yeah. of this. I, I posted something today where I was I was talking about the, the the missing piece of the the hybrid computing model that Microsoft is ushering in here is that they have this thing where you can be, have a tablet and you clip on a, t, uh, a keyboard of some kind and it becomes a an ultra book, but the missing piece, which by the way some PC makers have implemented, is the part where you plug it into something on your desk and it becomes your computer. And um, you know, right now we think about 
you know, all-in-one computers and tower computers, and then we have all these kind of portable computers. But, you know, realistically speaking, for most people, those, that, that can be one computer, you know. Um, someday in the future, that computer will be so powerful that it could be a smartphone. But, you know, whatever. I mean, it doesn't really matter. But um, I, as nice as all the sync stuff is, you know, like I use uh, SkyDrive for all my documents, for example, so I can turn on any one of my PCs and get to them immediately. It's great. But even better than that, and something I think that would be important for most people, is just have one computer. Yeah. I mean, just have one. You know, I should be able to put my Surface down in front of me and have like a two-screen system with my big screen here, my keyboard, my mouse, my webcam, whatever. Pick this thing up, walk out with it, and use it like a tablet. Clip on the the type cover that they already have, and it becomes an ultrabook essentially. Um, why wouldn't? Why would I not want to do everything? On the one device. It's just so convenient. I think because we haven't done that prior to this. You know, we have d different devices for different things. My, my phone, I work with my phone in a different way than I do with my tablet, than I do with my desktop. Yeah. And that's the change that we're going to have. Um, you know, uh, Microsoft right now is the first to take that leap. But can what is Apple going to do? Because obviously, Apple sells far more iPads and, and iPhones than right. they do computers. Oh, right. So uh, actually, when your focus is selling computers, devices, you have a lot of devices. <laughs> you know, yeah. I mean, one of the thing, one of the common sense things that Microsoft could bring to this market is that their primary business is not selling hardware; it's selling software and services. Well, actually, devices and services they call it. But you know, it may not behoove Microsoft to have different types of computers. It may make sense for them just to have one that does everything. You know. Um, maybe that's what it takes. You know, Apple's business model is very much based around selling you all kinds of devices, and um, you know, obviously they also get you on the upgrade thing. You know, because when you upgrade a device, you have to buy a new device. Whereas if you can upgrade the software, you can get new capabilities on the same device. You know, the argument for Apple was, well, you know, they get you in with the iPod, then they get you into an iPhone, then you finally buy a tablet, and then you buy a computer. But the last step, that last leap, is not happening. It's not happening. Yeah. And I don't know if that yeah, was their you know original what, though, model but, behind this, but I don't know if uh, that's their goal. Obviously, that was definitely their goal in the beginning. But obviously, on the other hand, their devices have had such success that they almost don't really care if you get, they get either the computer anymore. Their their inability to sell people on their computers is not Apple's problem; it's the market's problem. The world is moving away from computers. You know, um, you see a lot of people who um, have an iPhone, an iPad. And a five-year-old Windows PC, you know? Yeah. Which and is as much as they may want a MacBook Pro that costs, you know, $1,500, eh, you know, the PC kind of works. So. But you know what? The people that have people a five-year-old PC don't really yeah. need I – th I think the iPad is doing everything they need they needed to do. Right. That's the point. You know, so it, 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 you know it's, it would be better for Apple if you bought more Macs. But it's also really good for Apple when you don't buy another PC and you buy another iPad, you know. And so I think that's the, uh, I think that's where you know that's why they're successful because you're still buying an Apple thing. I, I you know, I, I I actually you know we when we talk about the future of computing, I keep saying to people, you know, this is the future. It's these tablet devices, and on the PC side, that means clip-on keyboards that convert into ultrabooks and all these other things. You know, on the Apple side, the future is kind of no Mac, and I I mean I know that. In the same way that on the PC side, people say, oh, no, 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 no. We're always going to need the desktop. We're always going to need keyboards and mouse. We're always going to need all these old-fashioned things. No, you don't. You don't. And on the Mac, on the Apple side, it's the Mac that goes away, isn't it? it this other stuff is so much more successful than the Mac. You know? Uh, they need to... Uh, maybe they don't. You know, Apple doesn't do things conventionally, but, you know, uh, but then, Microsoft... Then, what's that the business, future of the Mac? Upgrade. I mean, what's the future of the Mac operating system? Mac OS, uh, what what can they do with this? Because it, if you look at Nothing. everything else, yeah. it, it's an archaic way of doing things, right? If the evolution of uh, computing is, are these detachable screens and these, you know, really cool right. UIs and they're interchangeable amongst devices, uh, Apple is now no sticking future, there's to... No fu there's no future for it. You know, when, when Microsoft switched to the Windows NT kernel for Windows, uh, Windows 2000 was marketed as um, powered by NT. And the future on Apple's side is going to be some pro version of the iPad that does have a clip-on keyboard and a mouse 
and it's going to say powered by OS 10 or however they market it. It's going to be the same thing, and it's it's going to be some multitasking, super powerful version of you know whatever. And people are going to complain because Photoshop doesn't run on this or blah blah blah, like they did you know when during the transition to OS 10. But this is these are things that are just going to be resolved over time, you know. And what what happens is Mac OS 10 goes away, you know. I don't yeah. think. I mean, I'll, I mean, uh, I, this is not based on any information at all. This is complete supposition. But I've been very interested to see that a Apple never announced any intention to go to like an OS 11. You know, they don't really talk about that. Well, they never been, have. <laughs> they never. I mean, have. they're running out of point versions. You know, I mean, at some <laughs> yeah. point you're going to hit the the wall on that, and I don't know what you do next. But I I sort of think there doesn't need to be an OS 11. That you know they'll milk OS 10. As long as they can on these devices, which have incredible margins and all that kind of stuff, but you know that where the future is going to be higher volume, lower price, more powerful iOS. You know, it's iOS. The future is iOS. It's not Mac OS ten for them. For them, yeah, obviously. Um, and we're going to see the changes coming to the software because they they really going to be concentrating on the software in the coming years with this thing. Yeah. And by and, the way, and the, the this, look of it. This is happening on the Windows side, too. We're just not as far along in the transition. I mean, we, uh, Windows 8, you know, Microsoft does things differently than Apple. So Microsoft doesn't throw away backwards compatibility. They don't create something new. They put something new and something old, and they let you do both of them together. <laughs> you know, it's... Um, but do you it's think the that's the problem Microsoft with them? Is. I mean, maybe that's why people are, are bitching it's and moaning about this. Of course it is. It, it, of course it is. And there will always be this, like, crowd of people who will always complain that, you no, know, you know, we've always done it this way. We can't, you know, we can't live without this. You know, yeah, we can. We can. I mean, the Windows 8 stuff, the Metro stuff has to evolve. It will. And once it does, the desktop will go away. The desktop is our OS X. Yeah. Know? No, you're absolutely it's right. Too, it's going to go away. Um, I, 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 am, I am curious to see where the evolution of OS X goes. I, I guarantee they, they might I not even... it goes away. Totally goes away, and they have this new weird operating system that does both. No, the, the, listen. At, at WWDC this year or next year, they're going to announce this transition, and it's going to be based on OS. And it's you know, and they'll they do it right. They do these things good. They, they, they'll they'll be okay. And everybody will say, "Oh my God, I need this. I need to have this." <laughs> of course, you don't because, understand you know, th these these ecosystems that are created um, are much more restrictive and advantageous to the maker of the platform, right? You know, um, uh, Microsoft sort of always vaguely benefited because people wrote Windows apps, you know, Windows applications, desktop applications. Um, when people make de like Metro apps, they explicitly benefit because they get a chunk of it. And, um, you know, and there's a benefit for the user because there are certain reliability and performance promises that they can make. And uh, you don't have to worry about viruses anymore. I mean, it's, it's kind of a win-win. You know, they, obviously they want to move to this system uh, on the apple side they of course they do as well and the, the, you can see the transition pieces they put in place you know they come out with a mac app store that coexists with downloads just like windows 8 by the yeah. way uh and but then they have the closed app store like on ios that's only closed which is rt you know and and these things are, are they're all going to come together it's gonna get, they're going to converge on both sides there's no doubt about it uh we have one little break and i want to go into uh our last topic of the day paul we 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 had a busy show today and i have one thing that i really want to touch on because this is something we talk about so we're giving you guys an extra couple of minutes here and uh i want to talk about squarespace.com uh, an easy way to create a website i i really don't have to sell squarespace to you guys because it, it's i think everybody here that's listening to the show knows um, if you're looking to make a website and you don't want to deal with coding, you don't want to deal with the hassle uh, of, of creating a site, the most easy thing to do is go to squarespace.com and sign up there. You could use offer code WhatTheTech1. Uh, you can sign up for a free trial and you get 10% off your purchase on a new account. It's phenomenal. Um, I'm working on a personal blog right now and I'm going to be using Squarespace to develop the personal site because I don't want to search. Uh, I generally have done WordPress sites and I don't want to search finding the right theme and creating and maintaining it. Squarespace does everything because the hosting is there. You could get the domain there. You could get the website there and create it right there with a one easy interface. Uh, I believe This Week in Radio Tech, which is on GFQ now, their website is a Squarespace site and I go in there manually and I add the shows in every week. And it's amazing that I could get the stats for the site. I could see the trends, what page everybody's going to. So it's a one-stop shop for everything you need to do with a site. Uh, and it's... A, it, 
just amazing, amazing service. Uh, and they're great guys over there. Squarespace.com. You could use offer code what the tech one. You sign up. I know Paul's using Squarespace and uh, you really like it. I do. Yep. I know you haven't used it for to its full potential yet. No. I am a simpleton. Very, very simple. Listen, I, and, and people have said to me, hey, listen, I want to I do some of the CSS stuff myself. Uh, you could do that. They have a developer version where you could do all that, you know, nitty gritty coding stuff on your own. That's not me. I don't really do website stuff. My brain stops at talking. I'm not very right. good at that. But if you are, if you're a developer, you could just uh, sign up and use the developer package and uh, do everything there. Squarespace.com. You could use offer code what the tech one. Uh, you can sign up for a free trial. It's at no credit card needed, nothing like that. And uh, if you decide to sign up, you get 10% off your first purchase on a new account. I want to thank Squarespace for supporting the show. Uh, Paul, I, I want to touch on this really briefly. Uh, okay. We've been talking about internet speeds in this country and how it, it's so sporadic. You know, you, you have Fios, I have Fios here on the East Coast, and I'm getting 150 megabits by right. 75 megabit upload. I'm sure you got insane speeds too. I'm not too sure what yours is. And then you yeah. go... You know, let's say I go to Long Island and it's not a Fios area and somebody has, you know, cable vision or something and they're getting 10 megabits by one megabit upload. Uh, and it gets even worse. I know people living in Florida and they're getting awful speeds. I know someone that has uh, Time Warner in Florida sure. and I think it's Time Warner. Don't, don't quote me because then I'm going to get a message saying Time Warner's not in Florida. It, one of them. <laughs> and. It, you're People wrong, Andrew. So pedantic, yes. And you're getting, you know, awful, awful speed. 10 megabits by one, 5 megabits by two. I mean, it's so sporadic. Uh, the FCC wants gigabit internet speeds in all 50 states by 2015. Uh, the FCC chairman has made it a priority for him, and he's calling for internet speeds to be all across the country, by, uh, to be gigabit all across the country by 2015. And this is kind of on the heels of the Google internet service, the Google Fiber that was set up, I believe, in Kansas City, which is 100 times faster than the standard broadband speed in this country. Right. And this is an issue that we've discussed. Do you, do you think government intervention in some yeah. way will I I, force people, force these providers to say, okay, you know what, I have to build these gigabit networks and offer these speeds to people? No, I think that uh, it becomes part of the infrastructure it should be treated like electricity or gas or whatever and that there needs to be a standard where people have to be guaranteed a minimum speed of some kind and that that you just get that for being an american i mean i know that sounds kind of nuts but think of it this way um you know one of the founding principles of our country is that we can vote you know and that the internet today is the primary way that we get information and that we cannot be educated voters unless we have access to that information. It's not like the old days. You know, we, we don't go to big books and look up laws. You know, you find out about that stuff through the internet. And I, I think the only way you can have an educated voting populace is to give them access to the internet. I think it has Absolutely. to happen. Yeah, and, you know, and what he is saying, he's not saying that this is going to, by 2015, you're going to see everybody getting it. He What he wants to see is a few in neighborhoods in every state, almost every state have this option, you know, in, in a certain there's neighborhood. Always gonna be, there's always going to be have-nots. I've not been to this part of the world in a while, but up in the, um, uh, what's it called? I just forgot the name of it. There's, a, there's a, an area up in uh, northeastern Vermont, uh, Island Pond is the name of the town we were in, but it's um, the Northeast Kingdom. Yeah. Um, it is the most remote area, one of the most remote areas in, in the United States. And um, it's one of the last to, to get, I don't know what they have now, but they, you know, they had dial-up, you know, a decade after I had a cable modem. I mean, they, that's all they had, you know, and it's, it's the, it, Verizon got into trouble in Vermont because they had promised to put broadband in all over the place. And then they realized what a daunting and expensive task that was. And because of the relatively low population, it was probably never going to, you know, their investment was never going to get paid back and then they refused to do it. And yeah. I think there was some kind of settlement where they sold off the operation to a local company and, you know, that kind of thing. It's just, it's a mess. And, um, you know, this, you know, that's the way it is. I mean, obviously there are bigger real world problems in some parts of even this country. If you've ever spent any time along the Amtrak belt in like Baltimore or in Detroit or whatever, I mean, obviously there are there are other issues, uh, but I think this is really important. I think this is, um, 
I think this is something that has to happen everywhere. Yeah, yeah and, and and the, you know, I imagined I, I got I got DSL in 1997, and. Yeah. It was, I mean, when I got, we were one of the first test areas that they put Verizon DSL mm-hmm. and it was awful. I mean, the service was not reliable at all. And, sure. but I was getting six, 64 K. So six forty kilobits, no kilobytes, not kilobits, no kilobytes or kilobits, 64 <laughs> K by, uh, I believe it was like. 12k download and that was blazing fast when you compared it to compared it to 56k speeds sure bits not bytes yeah bits bits not bytes yeah and and then we got time warner cable and that was that was far faster than what everybody else was getting but there was such a big gap and i always thought like over the next 10 years you know in the 2000s we'll see that gap close and it'll get closer in speed so even if you have not so great internet it's going to be a closer gap and that's not the tr- that's not the fact at all yeah. the gap has widened and it, oh, it's, no, it's, it's unbelievable is, to me this is one of the <laughs> a million things in this country where the gap between the have and the have nots yeah. has grown just dramatically and outrageously huge and, it's, and, it's and we're huge. not talking about and we're not talking like if you're in a better area you get better internet that's not true at all it depends on where they decided to deploy Yep. One of the the Manhasset, New York, is one of the the richest zip codes in America, and they don't have Verizon FiOS, and they're stuck with awful, awful internet speeds over there. So it's not like, well, the wealthy are getting the speeds, and we're not. No, it just. No, it it ha- just I think it has more to do with how easy it is uh, to lay this stuff out. You know what the density of the population is. There's all these weird issues. Like it, it, it it's not money. I mean, obviously money's involved, but it's not. You know, the, it's not the the people's ability to pay for the connection. It's just. There are a lot of, you know, stands. we talked about how when, you know, Phoenix was one of the first places where they uh, put cable modem in. And the reason was it was flat. It was really easy to roll this thing out there, you know, at the time. And it had kind of a nice population density that just made it, you know, something that was fairly easy to do 20 years ago now. Yeah. It's interesting. And and one of the arguments is, do the, it's not so much the telcos anymore, do the cable companies want you to have these these unbelievable speeds? Because... You're, you're, the way that you consume content changes when that's the case. Sure. So do they want you to consume content on the internet compared to television? No, because they're in the TV business. Well, but I actually See, I actually think the future of TV is IP-based too, though. I think everything is going to go over these connections. Everything. No, I, I agree with you, but you're still consuming. I'll, I'll give you an example. Do, does, does Verizon Fios, mm-hmm. which is all IP-based, do they want yeah. me to consume my content on... Netflix, or do they want me sitting in front of my TV and watching whatever yeah. TV is on my TV? I, mean, I don't think they care. You know, you're you don't think so. I think they do. Way. I think they do. Yeah. It, it, so you're saying, in other words, that it may be more valuable for them for you to be using TV because perhaps you pay for pay services and they get some kind of a yeah a portion of because the they're in the TV business. And, yeah, they're in the TV business. Okay. Yeah. I mean, they're not making money from phones anymore. They're not. I mean, they're not in the phone business anymore when it comes to copper lines right right they right. switched everybody over to ip if you have verizon fires they're, they're doing all uh, ip based even if you're not i think they're switching over to their voice digital voice service so they're kind of evolving into that but i i still think the, the cable companies want you watching cable tv and the, the, the yep. internet has been secondary but now there's been this switch where people actually care more about their internet speeds than they do about what channels they have on their tv so I, I just think it's an interesting shift, and I, I find it interesting that the chairman of the FCC is kind of weighing in on this and saying, hey, listen, I want to see something change a little bit. Um, is it going to cause this uprise in internet speeds, and are these companies going to switch everything over? No. But it may be some sort of encouragement where they're going to start testing stuff, and it's going to create more competition. You know, I would love them to open up the fiber networks and say, okay, you know what, just like they did with, with uh, the copper lines. Right. Where other companies could come in and sell the cop and and offer you fiber service. Yep. That'd be great. Yep. A boy could only dream, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get there. We'll get there. We but will. we do need to wrap it up. I know Paul needs to go and do stuff. <laughs> Paul's <laughs> so a busy man. So uh, I want to talk about windsuperset.com is his site. I'm on there uh, every day. I get my, uh, my news from there now. You become my news site. Forget about Engadget and all those guys. I go to windsuperset for all my information. <laughs> Paul is a very trusting man, and that's where I get it. Paul also does a great podcast, Windows Weekly on the Twit Network. 
Thursdays at 2 p.m. East with Mary Jo Foley and, of course, uh, Leah Laporte. You can catch that on twit.tv. And uh, anything else, Paul? Are you, are you anything special going on? <laughs> special? Special no, stuff? Really. I mean, I've been. No, not really. Uh, you could follow oh, follow Paul on Twitter at the Rot. I'm at Andrew Zarian on Twitter. You can follow me there. We also have a What the Tech uh, Facebook page. If any of you want to follow it, we post our show links there and uh, just little information here and there about the show. Uh, it's on Facebook. Uh, just search What the Tech and you can find it right there. And uh, that's it for this week, guys. I appreciate it. I want to hear your feedback. I got some great emails throughout the week. You can send an email at guysfromqueens at gmail.com and I'll, uh, I'll be sure to forward it to Paul. I sent him a bunch of emails this week. And uh, we'll see you all next week on What the Tech. Good night, everybody. What the Tech. Good night, everybody.